So hello and welcome to the New Gig Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Hodgson. And today I'm delighted to be joined by university lecturer and CEO of Crowd Potential, Dr. Rochelle Haynes. How are you doing, Rochelle? I'm great. Great to be here as well. Fantastic. So Rochelle, give the viewers and listeners a bit of a background about the various things that you've got on your plate at the moment, um, but also some of the exciting uh, projects as well you're involved in. Sure. So what I do as a company, my company is called Crowd Potential. And what we do essentially is to help businesses and governments with attracting digital nomads and also creating the infrastructure, whether that's in the country or within a specific organization, um, that would allow for freelancers to work well within that location, but also to contribute to the location if they wanted to as well. Because a lot of freelancers, when they go to work in another country, another location, they often seek to see how they can give back to that location. So I help to facilitate that process. Um, it also goes on the other back as well, on the, the, uh, the other way around, in that I help countries to work with freelancers based across the globe. Um, so let's say, for example, I'm working with the Caribbean government to mm. help them to attract their diaspora freelancers to work in this country and help solve national level problems within that country as well. So I'm guiding that process and helping to streamline so, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what I do, what my business does. So I hope that's helpful. Excellent. And you're also a PhD doctor and lecturer as well into the bargain. <laughs> yeah, it helps. It does help. <laughs> yeah. I'm a senior lecturer with the university of the West of England, also called UE Bristol here in England. Excellent. What a fantastic number of roles and hats that you've got on. I think this is ideal the place yeah. to be able to speak about some of the tro- topics we've got in terms of the future yeah. of work and the change in labor market as, as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that you've got a great helicopter view because you're looking at different markets, different geographies, and, and, and maybe sort of seeing some similar trends there, perhaps. Yeah. So it's very interesting because over the last, not even just um we well we've been seeing the changes for more than 10 years now where we're seeing a lot of people are choosing to work more independently um to start their own business and to move Mm. away from full-time work i'm not saying there's still not a large percentage of people in full-time work they are but slowly we're seeing people seeking to prioritize the work-life balance seeking to go after more challenging work Um, challenging, I should say, more interesting work. Mm. And also with a bit of a mental health crisis is what we're seeing in the workforce today, especially post-pandemic. A lot of people are choosing to put their personal well-being and the well-being of their family first. Mm. So freelancing allows for that in many ways because it allows flexibility. And Mm. where you allow work, some companies are forcing their employees back into the office. We've seen increasingly that employees are leaving and choosing to work in different ways. And also where employees have been now exposed to remote work, they're choosing a lifestyle that more facilitates their well-being. So we've seen, for example, in the IT sector, there's a real crisis for talent. And in the UK, across various sectors, there's a real crisis for talent. Up to two months ago, they were reporting more than 71% of UK companies are short on talent and finding Mm. it very hard to find talent within their organizations. And of course, we've heard about the great resignation. We've heard about people quiet quitting, basically just resigning and disengaging from their daily work. Um, So we're seeing... The, we're seeing a shift in tide and what we were calling an invisible revolution before being that there was an increase in freelancing and virtual work that that has now become less invisible and it's become more obvious and if yeah. companies are not willing to entertain different ways of working and accommodate more flexible working or even start to think about how they can work more with freelancers and they're the ones <clears throat> excuse me then they're the ones that are going to suffer with a talent shortage in the future Mm. And this is really interesting. I think this point that, you know, it's the, the, the technology is there uh, to facilitate this revolution or evolution, however you look at it. Yeah. But the kind of the mindsets of companies and organizations hasn't really caught up to the to the reality. And, you know, is the tipping point going to be that in this war for talent, if you're not offering sort of flexibility and opportunity for the, 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 the workforce, you won't get the knowledge, expertise and talent that you need for your organization to thrive. 
Absolutely. So we're seeing so many companies, um, and I see it especially in the Caribbean, because right. I work between, I work globally, but in terms of my base, where I'm physically, I'm between the UK and Barbados most of the time. I'm, I fly between the two. I want the um, same, I want the same setup. That's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm you follow, know, I'm you know, like if I, preach it, <laughs> if I preach a, um, a digital nomad life, I got to experience it as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, one of the things I see in both countries, um, especially in Barbados, is this forcing workers back into the context of the office, right. um, saying you have to come back or else. And yep. some offices have described that response, and they said it's, it's due to bad behavior, some workers not quite complying with remote work, um, while others have said, no, we just want to be able to see you. You know, we want right. to, they're, they're trying to go back to that old way. And where that has happened, I've known a lot of companies through through my own work who have lost talent and are, are now seeking help to build a model that allows them to work with both freelancers and employees at the same time. Because yeah. that's what my company specializes in, helping facilitate that blended, working with a blended workforce. Yeah. So we're seeing more and more that companies are suffering. But it's not just the companies. It's also, in terms of that, free, the impact of the freelancers, we're seeing it in countries as well. Before we had very few countries that would offer um, a freelance visa. Yes. And now we're seeing more and more countries offering a freelance visa. Visa. And I know Barbados were were at Barbados was at the forefront during the pandemic when they offered yeah. their welcome stamp visa. And you've seen a lot of countries that since it's become very much the norm now, so mm. much that that's become competitive. So whereas now countries are trying to attract digital nomads one of the things that they're being forced to think about is if when you're now competing with a sea of countries who are now also offering let's say yes. a welcome stamp to work for a year mm. and it's a certain fee and whatnot you now have to think of how will you differentiate your country to right. make it attractive and the choice of a place to work from absolutely so talk us through the, the process how would it work if i wanted to go to barbados and become a digital nomad for a year how do i register for this and also what are the compliance issues and obligations on me from kind of a tax or social security uh element just so we can you know educate potential uh digital nomads out there who are maybe sort of thinking about taking this uh, taking up this opportunity uh how does it, how does it work rochelle tell us i'll pause just a little bit here because my throat is itching me so bad but i'll pause so you can edit it out very clearly. okay Yep. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, good. Reasoning. So how the Barbados visa works is that you have to fill out a form online. Basically, yep. you're allowed to register to work or apply, we should say, to work for, in Barbados for one year. Yep. And what you do is you have to pay a fee of US 2000 um, yes. US two thousand dollars for that application. Um, if you are coming with a family, you pay US three thousand, so you and your family can come. Yep. And the idea is that you can work in Barbados. Um, from from a tax perspective, mm. you are not allowed to take up work in Barbados. So basically, okay. you can work from Barbados for, from a, for another company overseas or whatnot. But for tax purposes, you can't work in Barbados. Yeah. Um, physically, yes, but not for a Barbadian company. You can't say you're going to move to Barbados for a year and pick up a job in a Barbadian company I understand yeah yeah, yeah. so those are the main that's kind of the, the very basic outline of how it works and then in addition to that the government would provide additional guidance and support especially for families in terms of where families can register their kids or how to yeah. go about that process or if also they wanted to extend their visas um, mm. so there's that's kind of the basic shell of how it works and it tends to be a very simple online process where they apply for the visa and within five days you can be approved so it's not very complicated oh, wow. at all yeah Excellent. so you see a lot of countries as well where they offer a work visa and mm. the fee might be less so let's say the fee is us 250 pounds or dollars for example yeah. whatever the currency is um mm. what you would see is the fee is cheaper but the length of approval time is a lot longer. So yeah. there's a lot of variation between the two. Um, what we're seeing from a Barbados perspective is that based on how the visas run already, one of the things I've been advocated for, advocating for is rather than countries 
issue one specific work visa or in Barbados case, a welcome stamp visa. Mm. Countries should issue a suite of visas that is suited to different types of welcome. Well, they call them welcome stampers in Barbados, but we call okay. them generally digital nomads. Yeah. And countries tend to issue an all encompassing visa for digital nomads. But in many cases, that all encompassing visa, excuse me, that all encompassing, I'm going to say it again, you're going to have to edit. My apologies. <laughs> <coughs> I'm getting a little cold, so my throat is really scratchy this morning. That's lo lo the, the the effects of London in. Uh, I in, tell in you, this this weather switching. I'm making <laughs> editing work for you. Yes, you are. That's <laughs> true. That's um, all good. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So while an all-encompassing visa is good with regards to get attracting visas, attracting digital nomads to your country. Digital nomads take so many different forms. They come in so many different shapes and sizes. For example, um, you might have digital nomads might, who might just be interested in coming for a year or less than a year and then moving on to another country who might just be coming to have fun or a good time. Then yep. you have those that come as families. You have those older persons, those more retired that are seeking entrepreneurship opportunities. Yeah. Um, there's there's a range of different digital nomads and i think where countries really want to be competitive then they have to start thinking of how you can offer a suite of digital nomad visas mm. that caters to the needs of everyone yeah. um a, a, another issue as well is how do you differentiate your digital nomad visa in a way that allows it to add value now mm. one of the things that i've seen is countries issue digital nomad visas the digital nomads are attracted to the country. In the Barbados case, when it was done the first time, it was um, there were celebrations that in terms of like a launch party and dinners to kind of entertain and make um, these freelancers feel welcome. Yeah. I know a lot of countries and also even in Barbados as the time has passed, freelancers feel like they then just disappear into the location right. and that they are not really integrated or sometimes even they don't feel connected sometimes to the location they feel they're just kind of left to their own devices mm, but i think okay. where a country wants to differentiate when it comes to freelancers think of what you can do to try to help the freelancer to feel more integrated and also setting up a system and i know i'm working with some countries on this right now setting up systems hubs infrastructures programs that allow the freelancers to for example knowledge share for example, partner with organizations where they can give back. Because I know yeah. most freelancers, they choose countries based on where they think they can have a positive impact mm. in addition to just working from that location. But beyond what they do organically, let's say through WhatsApp groups or whatever the case, mm. um, they want to have a larger impact. So rather than, I know a lot of freelancers, for example, like when I was in Thailand and Indonesia, I would meet up with some of them and we'd do like a beach cleanup we would do a little right. community organization. Yeah. But mm. where countries have specific pain points and they want to really value, they want to really benefit from the value that freelancers bring. And a lot of freelancers that come to these shores tend to be experts in their fields and their areas yes. and very innovative in business. They should really think about, in addition to offering the welcome stamp or digital nomad visa, how can you set up programs or infrastructure that would allow for easy knowledge sharing and partnership with freelance yeah. so they can feel more integrated? Mm, that's a very interesting point. And also, let's go back to the issue of mental health, because we've seen through the COVID-19 pandemic and mm -hmm. the, uh, the element of remote work has brought with it opportunities, but also a new set of challenges as well, Rochelle, in terms of how to be a freelancer, how to uh, be motivated, how to meet mm -hmm. people, how to be able to interact uh, through technology, but have it as something you can harness to um, extend and heighten your, 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 your experiences as a worker. Um, people feeling connect disconnected, and in some cases, depressed. How can uh, this be uh, uh, addressed? So I've seen this, I've seen different companies and also the freelancers themselves try to tackle this in different ways. Okay. I have a colleague, um, 
her name is Mita Karaman. She's based, I think she's based in New Mexico, in Mexico now. I might be wrong, yeah. or she might be back in New York. She herself is a digital nomad. But she's she started an app called Adventurely, which mm. basically allow freelancers to find communities wherever they travel to. So if you travel to um let's say Bermuda, if you travel to Thailand. Yeah. You log on to that app and you can find a freelancer community and connect with them that mm. way. Um, I know in Barbados, it's done a lot more organically where there is a freelancer WhatsApp group. Sometimes yeah. you might have to know somebody to be able to then get connected to these WhatsApp groups. But mm. I think it's become a lot easier for people to connect into them now. Um, yeah. it's, some of them have become so popular. For example, I've heard freelancers say that when they took a taxi from the airport, taxi drivers have recommended freelancer groups to them. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, they're, <laughs> yeah there's one group called the Barbados Black Packs. And okay. because they're so well known for supporting local businesses, um, including the taxi drivers, yeah. that the taxis usually say, okay, try connecting with this group. Mm. I'll give you this person's number and they'll add you to the WhatsApp group. So they're, they're both organic ways. And then some companies are often seeking... Um, to make a business out of it, to actually setting up innovative ways of freelancers connecting. But what mm. I would say to freelancers is perhaps try volunteering, start with a volunteering opportunity, yeah. but also look for co-working spaces within um, the location that you go to. So I know right. even some um, nomads, they tend to choose the location based on the co-working, co-living spaces that are mm. set up. Okay. So by taking part, by reaching out and taking part in those initiatives or finding those locations, that can be just a start. And then they might expose you then to other places as well. That's a, that sounds really interesting. And then also there's the element of, as you say, of being part of the uh, uh, society. But what are the main yeah. elements on top of this that come up in terms of the, the do's and don'ts of being a successful freelancer that you that, that you've seen from your from your work and studies yeah I would say if you are looking to freelance for the first time that especially if you're looking to do it from a location independent yeah point of view because some freelancers they freelance from um, they work from coffee shop to coffee shop or they just mm. work from home but if you're planning to be a digital nomad where you're location independent and working from country to country then you have to think really practically mm. and prepare from very early make sure for example because i guess you would know your circumstance too whether or not um, you're working for one company or is it that you have um your getting jobs from here or there yeah or whatnot. you would have to know your setup i would say start preparing maybe a year in advance think mm -hmm. about the level of savings that you need think of the cost of living within that country that you're going to investigate the different locations and if possible try to speak to a local or join a local right. um a freelance facebook group in that country or instagram whatever the group slack group try to find out about that location where's the best place to live how's the best place to connect but try to connect before you get to the location mm. because it would make your life a lot easier when you get there i think how a freelancer feels within a country because as you mentioned like loneliness is a real yeah. issue for some freelancers some yeah. freelancers are happy to be lonely because some of them <laughs> do go for the solitude to work, whereas others um, want to connect. I would say if you want to collect, connect locally as well, yeah. let's look at volunteering opportunities. There are a lot of volunteering societies in different locations. And also, more organically, join a gym <laughs> to, <laughs> if you have a pet. I find if you have a family, pet and kids, that makes it um, yeah. a lot easier. That won't be everyone. So mm. sometimes... Um, joining local institutions like a gym or joining a charity or just helping out with an event can be really help handy as well. Yeah. Um, it goes both ends though, because it's one thing for the freelancer to prepare to go to a country, but there are things that a country can do to also make a location, let's say, more freelance friendly. Yes. So often yeah. we see again that countries reach out um, to freelancers attract them with the visas and we spoke earlier about um, integrating with freelancers but also think about the infrastructure think about whether wi-fi is readily available across the country and in different locations yep. and what can you do possibly to encourage um, let's say cafes and other locations to 
make their Wi-Fi accessible. Mm. Because even after the pandemic, there's still some cafes and whatnot that you go into and they say, sorry, you can't have our code. And I know <laughs> from speaking to some of them, they say that there's a fear that freelancers will come and work all day and take up the space. Or right. they say people will come in and they're worried about people watching movies all day and taking up the bandwidth. But a lot okay. of that has to do with what partnerships are created with the service providers and what packages might block might block, block and allow certain activities mm. while using the Wi-Fi. Mm. Um, also in terms of the locations. So many places that offer freelance visas, uh, more and more they're getting better at offering. Well, some of them have co-working spaces that exist, but some still have very limited spaces uh, for freelancers to work properly, especially in mm. private accommodation. Yeah. So what I would say to private landlords, for example, if it is that you know that digital nomads is going to be a big part of the, um, the tenants that you're going to attract, then think of how you can possibly create a space that freelancers can comfortably work from within that apartment. I know mm. some freelancers have said that they couldn't find a desk or even a counter in some of the spaces they were working from. And that was a real problem for them. Mm. Even if freelancers are staying at hotels and hotels are getting better as well at yeah. providing specific working spaces now for freelancers. But if you are a landlord, think about what you can do to also accommodate a freelancer in your in the home that you are renting and whatever yeah. the case might be. Um, there are also other things as well in terms of where issues come up and how those issues are dealt with. A lot of freelancers have spoken about being, for example, ripped off by yep. certain unfair landlords or mm. being taken advantage of or feeling unsafe and whatnot. There are a lot of things that countries can do um, to try to mitigate this. And where you have, for example, or where you create a centralized hub where freelancers can engage or where freelancers know if they call this number, this is how they can have their problem their problem um, dealt with or mitigated. Then it also gives the freelancer a sense that they're not forgotten or they're not left alone in this country to fend for themselves. Because right. I've heard of cases where freelancers have felt that there was a country where freelancers um, were complaining of being constantly sexually harassed. Oh, and right. when they contacted mm. the police about it, they were constantly dismissed and they left the country because of it. There are other oh, cases dear. of mm. freelancers where they felt they were ripped off by the landlords. They can get their deposit back, but because they weren't local, they had no way of dealing with it. So whereas governments also think of what kind of um, hub or support or hotline infrastructure or somebody that would allow for freelancers to feel a level of, I don't know, support as well. Within, mm. their within that host country. And that's also good because freelancers do spend a lot of money to relocate to these places and they do right. contribute to the locations that they go to. And they want to integrate, from my experience, some of them, and they want to also give back. Mm. Well, I think this is great advice to be able to give to individuals, some of the, some of the things to look out for, but also for um, people in administrations how can they yeah. actually facilitate this process and be really a more attractive place to uh, attract the talent, uh, but also the individuals yeah. who will be able to uh, to contribute to society as well as professional life there. And I think these are great uh, points we've got, Rochelle. Absolute mm -hmm. pleasure to speak to you as you always. Too. And we look forward to following up on these points. Excellent. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.